This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Welcome to this Razor COVID-19 special. I'm Shini Somara. Over the last months, we've been looking at every aspect of the COVID-19 pandemic and the virus that causes it, SARS-CoV-2. One of the techniques we've been using is animation to describe the virus, its origins, and measures to contain it. We began by going right back to basics and asking, what is a virus? Nucleic acids are large molecular structures known as biopolymers that form the essential components of life. They are split into two types, deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, and ribonucleic acid, RNA. Every living thing on our planet is DNA-based, with the exception of viruses, which can be RNA-based. And some argue that viruses aren't living at all. So what are the roles of DNA and RNA? How are they different? And how do they interact? Both can be broken down into smaller sections called nucleotides, consisting of a phosphate, a sugar, and a base. The sugar separates the type of nucleic acid being either deoxyribose or ribose. In DNA, the base can be one of four different types, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, which codes the genetic information a bit like a four-letter alphabet. In RNA, thymine is replaced by uracil. Each base has a singular opposing base to which it can bond, creating what is known as a base pair. Adenine always pairs with thymine or uracil, and cytosine always pairs with guanine. In DNA, base pairs form two complete opposing strands in a twisted ladder known as a double helix. RNA typically exists as a single strand, sometimes bonding with itself to create more stable structures. A living organism's entire DNA is called its genome. For humans, this consists of 3.2 billion base pairs. A person's entire genome is encoded in every cell of their body. It's split across 23 pairs of chromosomes, which exist in the nucleus of the cell. Sections of the DNA code for specific traits, such as height, eye color, and blood type. These coding sections are called genes. They're switched on or off, depending on the type of cell. If they're switched on, they inform the cell's ribosomes to produce proteins, which help provide that specific trait or function. This is achieved with an RNA strand called messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is the crucial link in understanding how viruses hijack cells, replicate, and then transmit. So what are viruses? Viruses are simple structures consisting of a small viral genome of either DNA or RNA, protected by a structural protein. They're also very old. Computational biology has shown that a retrovirus existed 450 million years ago in the Ordovician period, where life existed only in the oceans with mollusks and early forms of fish. There's also a widely accepted theory that RNA viruses predate DNA-based living organisms, known as the RNA world hypothesis. All living things can be infected by viruses. They hijack cells, insert their genetic payload, and try to replicate. In some cases, this can permanently alter the DNA of the species they have infected. A study of the human genome found that approximately 8% is LTR retrotransposins. These are the remnants of viruses in our DNA that were passed down to us before we were Homo sapiens. Although some can be beneficial, viruses are often spoken about and understood as pathogenic or disease-causing. Most pathogenic viruses that emerge to attack human cells are RNA-based. This includes Ebola, HIV, influenza, and coronavirus. The average RNA virus is 11,000 bases in comparison to the 3.2 billion in human DNA. 
but they can cause huge amounts of damage. The reason RNA viruses cannot get much larger is because the enzyme that transcribes RNA for replication, called RNA polymerase, makes a huge amount of mistakes that never get corrected. So larger complex RNA viruses mutate too much to survive, whilst smaller RNA viruses are constantly mutating. RNA polymerase transcribes viral RNA to produce messenger RNA. This takes us back into the cell and where RNA viruses hijack DNA processes. The new messenger RNA from the virus goes to the ribosome, instructing it to produce replications. This repeats with more ribosomes being hijacked until the cell is full of virus replications, causing it to burst and die, releasing the virus to infect more cells. DNA and RNA have a very close symbiotic relationship, which can be incredibly deadly in a very specific set of circumstances. As with life, what is fascinating is how immensely unlikely those circumstances are, that an RNA virus, which has no intentions or motive, can mutate to just the right genetic formula to enter a human host, alter its DNA, replicate, and then transmit to infect another human host, and for that to happen at just the right moment. But it's a case of probability. The chances of this happening and a new virus emerging is increased as humans continue to push back the natural world, populating every corner of the earth and moving more freely with air travel. They are both increasing their exposure to new viruses from wild animals and the risk of transmission between other humans. Without proper planning and containment strategies, including buffer zones between wild and domestic animals, the chances of a new virus emerging and taking hold in human populations, potentially causing the next deadly pandemic, is a case of when, not if. One of the main questions of the pandemic has been, where does this new virus come from? Phylogenetic analysis is a way of understanding the evolutionary history of an organism. Since the beginning of the pandemic, researchers all over the world have been using it to trace the origins of the virus. There's been a lot of speculation about the origins of the novel virus SARS-CoV-2, first detected in Wuhan, China in December 2019. It's believed that SARS-CoV-2 is a zoonotic virus, that is a virus that can jump from animals to humans. It's one of seven known coronaviruses that infect humans, all of which were originally zoonotic viruses. Four of them cause the common cold, with two believed to have come from rodents and two from bats. The other three, which all emerged in the 21st century, have been significantly more deadly, causing serious disease. They too have also been linked to coronaviruses in bats. We know this by studying the evolution of the virus genome using a technique called phylogenetic analysis. To start the analysis, a virus has to be collected and its genome sequenced to know its exact composition. For coronaviruses, this involves extracting the single RNA strand which contains all of the virus's genetic information. This can be broken down into individual units called nucleotides, which consist of one of four bases – adenine, uracil, cytosine and guanine. These can be read like a four-letter alphabet to create a long sequence that is unique to the virus. For coronaviruses, the sequence is approximately 30,000 base pairs long. Using computer analysis, the genome can be placed on a phylogenetic tree, which branches out to distinguish between the differences in the genetic code caused by mutations. Like a family tree, we begin to get a sense of the shared history a virus has with others. The more similar their genetic code, the more closely they are related and the closer the samples are on the tree. This is a phylogenetic tree of coronavirus genomes, spread across two subfamilies called alpha and beta coronaviruses. Here are the four human cold-causing coronaviruses, NL63, 229E, OC43 and HKU1. Below HKU1 is MERS-CoV, which emerged in 2012. Branch next to it is a bat coronavirus, which is genetically very similar and thought to be the ancestor. However, there is an almost identical coronavirus sequence taken from a camel with 99.8% similarity. 
This suggests the virus started in a bat, mutated to enter a camel from where it could then jump to humans. Similarly, we can see the first SARS-CoV, which emerged in 2002. Below it is another bat coronavirus, but again, an almost identical copy can be seen in a civet with 99.8% similarity. Our understanding is that, like the camel, the civet acted as an intermediary for the virus. At the bottom, closest to SARS-CoV, is the first viral genome sequence of SARS-CoV-2, taken from a patient in Wuhan. Branch next to it is another bat coronavirus, taken from a cave in Yunnan, China, which shares 96% of its genomic identity with SARS-CoV-2. Curiously, we see a pangolin coronavirus within the same branch network with 91% shared identity. Although more divergent than the bat genomic sample, its similarities in the viral spike protein is of most interest for scientists. The spike protein is the crown-like structure on the surface of the coronavirus, which contains what's known as the receptor binding domain that allows the virus to attach to the host cell. It's highly specific, meaning that it has to accurately match the host cell receptor for the virus to take hold. Looking more closely at the genome for just the spike protein, we can get an indication of how the bat and pangolin coronaviruses are similar or differ to SARS-CoV-2. This section codes for the spike protein and is split into two parts, S1 and S2. S1 is responsible for the first stages of viral entry into a human cell. This section of nucleotides codes for the receptor binding domain. Despite sharing 96% of its genomic identity with SARS-CoV-2, this is where the similar bat coronavirus differs, suggesting that it didn't jump directly from the known bat coronavirus to humans. However, curiously, this is where the pangolin genome matches, but genetic differences along the rest of the pangolin spike protein indicates that it cannot be the immediate precursor to SARS-CoV-2 either. There is another mystery to the spike structure of SARS-CoV-2. Further down the spike genome between S1 and S2 subunits is a small piece of code called a cleavage site. This helps the virus enter the cell and utilizes the enzyme furin, which is found in human cells and is abundant in respiratory tracts. It's an entry method shared by other viruses such as influenza and HIV, but, and most curiously, never seen in SARS-like coronaviruses before. Scientists believe this may hold the answer to where the SARS-CoV-2 virus comes from, as well as its improved transmissibility. If a SARS-like coronavirus with a furin site is found in a bat or pangolin or other animal, it is likely it will be the ancestor or intermediate host. The other possible explanation for this unusual furin site is viral recombination, where two viruses infect a cell at the same time, mixing their genomes to produce a new virus with mutations taken from aspects of both parent viruses. This is known to happen frequently in viruses such as HIV and the coronavirus family, where alpha coronaviruses do have furin sites in the spike protein. Whether this happened in a bat, a civet, or another animal entirely requires further testing and genomic sampling. There are over 1,000 species of bat, accounting for almost 20% of all mammal species. They are known to be a host of multiple coronaviruses, which have high genetic diversity, with some also known to be able to directly infect humans. For these reasons, scientists still suspect the likeliest ancestor of SARS-CoV-2 came from bats.
The cost of COVID-19, flights cancelled, planes grounded and billions of dollars in losses. But is there a path to recovery? Come with us on a journey as we explore the future of flying. Aviation, a new trail, Monday the 22nd to Friday the 26th of June on Global Business Europe. Don't forget you can sign up to our daily newsletter. We bring you all the top business headlines straight to your inbox. So sign up for free at this address. CGTN. See the difference. The best and in the long term only way to defeat COVID-19 is to develop a vaccine against the virus that causes it. We looked into the history of vaccines, how they work, how they're produced, and how long we may have to wait for one. Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, Coronavirus 2, or SARS-CoV-2, is the virus responsible for the current COVID-19 outbreak, declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization on 11th of March 2020. First detected in Wuhan, China in late 2019, its genomic sequence was successfully submitted to the online resource GenBank on January 5, 2020, arming pharma and biotech companies with the data needed to race towards a new vaccine. So how does a vaccine work? At its simplest, a vaccine works by infecting an individual with a dead or weakened form of the virus or bacteria, allowing the body to use its own immune response to provide a defence. The concept is attributed to Edward Jenner in 1796. He took the pus from a milkmaid stricken with the milder disease of cowpox and used it to infect a young boy who, as a result, became immune to the related but deadlier disease of smallpox. Jenner took the Latin word for cow, vacca, and cowpox, vaccinia, to name his discovery, vaccination. Vaccines became a powerful tool in preventing certain diseases like smallpox. During the so-called Spanish flu pandemic of 1918, which killed at least 50 million people at the end of the First World War, physicians tried everything they knew to treat it, even the ancient art of bleeding. The only thing that seemed to work was infusing the blood of a recovered patient into one stricken with the disease. This showed that a vaccine may hold the answer, but identifying the virus or bacteria culprit without modern day powerful microscopes was a near impossible task. The virus they sought was influenza, named in 15th century Italy after an epidemic supposedly influenced by the stars. There are four types of the virus, A, B, C and D. The 1917-18 flu was type A, highly infectious and responsible for modern day seasonal flu. Its structure consists of two surface proteins called antigens, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. Both have multiple variants, 18 in the case of hemagglutinin, which helps the virus to attach to cells, and 8 of neuraminidase, which helps the virus to penetrate human cells. These variants are used to identify different influenza types. For example, the 1917-18 flu was influenza A, H1N1. This is the same virus, albeit a new strain that was also responsible for the so-called swine flu pandemic of 2009. But it wasn't until English scientists isolated the virus in the nose of a patient infected with influenza A in 1933, and then learnt that it could be propagated in hen's eggs in 1935, that a possible vaccine could be tested, leading to the first influenza vaccine approved in 1945. So how do we make a vaccine now? Well, we still use eggs. The virus is injected inside the egg and allowed to propagate. It's then extracted and washed with detergent, exposing the genetic material to inactivate it. The hemagglutinin and neuraminidase are purified and then syringed into your body. The vaccine does no harm, but triggers an immune response, producing antibodies that bind to the hemagglutinin. This is called the lock and key method, where the antibody is unique to the specific virus. The body now has the ability to detect that virus in the future and produce antibodies immediately. These bind to the hemagglutinin, preventing the virus from forming a bond with human cells and causing the person to get sick. 
So can we use the same principles to generate a coronavirus vaccine? Possibly. The coronavirus family is separate from influenza, but shares common traits. On the outside is a glycoprotein spike. This crown-like structure is where the virus gets its name. Similar to hemagglutinin in influenza, this spike protein mediates entry of coronavirus into human cells. This is the lock to which the antibody key will bind. Teams from around the world are racing to find ways of targeting the spike protein for both drug discovery and novel vaccines. This process has been dramatically sped up thanks to computer modelling based on the successful genetic sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 and its submission to the GenBank. Currently, an effective treatment is harking back to the desperate actions of 1918. Trials are showing that seriously ill patients seem to be seeing benefits following an injection of blood serum from patients who have recovered from COVID-19. Regulatory bodies all over the world are also allowing human vaccine trials far earlier than normal, but it will still take time to ensure the safe rollout of any mass vaccination campaign. The earliest we could see a vaccine is still more than a year away, maybe as long as 18 months. Therefore, while we wait for a vaccine or other cure, following the advice to isolate and observe social distancing measures is still the best defence against the virus. It's a disease that could attack anybody. Life under lockdown. I don't ruffle pop back. It comes Madrid, as a shock to all of us. So I'm in home isolation. I'm Isabel Ewing in Budapest. We have a simple message for all countries. Test, test, test. After schools shut their gates from Friday. We are accelerating research. I said very clearly there's more to do. Develop a vaccine. You were the oldest person to have survived this nasty virus. Thank you so much for all you people. While we wait for a vaccine, we need other techniques to balance the needs of controlling the virus and opening up society. One technique that will assist us in leaving lockdown is contact tracing. That's where data systems and mobile technology keep track of whether we've come into contact with the virus and alert us if we need to isolate. Governments around the world have put either part or all of their population under strict lockdown measures in an attempt to stop the rapid spread of COVID-19. The goal is to reduce the number of daily cases to ensure it remains below the coping capacity of healthcare systems. This has been referred to as flattening the curve. But the concern is that if lockdown measures are eased, then a second peak and even later peaks could cripple healthcare systems into the near future. One strategy to maintain a reduction in daily cases without using mass lockdown measures is known as contact tracing. This involves identifying, tracking and isolating individual cases of COVID-19 to suppress it from spreading throughout a population. It's usually a very labour-intensive process, but now big data and technology are allowing for new solutions. The first country to lift local lockdown measures and trial one of these new technology-led contact tracing solutions is China. Here, local governments are pairing with major tech companies such as Alipay and Tencent to create what they're calling a traffic light system. Data points around a user's activities, personal connections and travel history provide a coloured health QR code. Red means you should be under supervised quarantine. Yellow indicates that you should self-quarantine for 14 days and green means that you can travel freely. 
Your status is regularly checked whilst traveling throughout the country. If you come into contact with the virus, then your status will change and you will no longer be able to travel, forcing you to isolate. A similar contact tracing approach has been very successful in South Korea. After a different coronavirus outbreak called MERS hit the country in 2015, emergency legislation was created which allowed health officials to trace the footsteps of citizens who test positive for an infectious disease using CCTV, credit card records and GPS data. When they received their first positive COVID-19 patient in January 2020, this legislation was brought to the fore again and used to identify everyone that had been in prolonged contact with the infected individual. They were all tested and then quarantined if necessary. The government also released anonymized smartphone alerts to inform the wider population of the infected person's previous movements. If tested positive, an infectious person can choose to self-isolate at home, but is required to download an app, which alerts an assigned health official if they leave their home during the quarantine period. This process has helped South Korea avoid national lockdown, but has raised privacy concerns that have forced other governments and institutions to look at alternative methods. Another country which has also avoided national lockdown by using widespread testing and very intensive traditional manual contact tracing is Singapore. To support these measures, the Ministry of Health released the app Trace Together. It's voluntary for people to download and has a strong focus on digital privacy measures, such as avoiding using location data. Instead, it works by using Bluetooth to identify other mobile phones within a two to five meter radius. As an individual goes about their day, the app logs the anonymized data for those who have been in close proximity. These are then stored in an encrypted log on the phone. If the individual wakes up the next day with a fever, this can be reported on the app, and then the Ministry of Health can request their log data, decrypt the information, de-anonymize it to reveal the phone numbers of those who have been in close contact, and then used to inform them to self-isolate. Using technology this way allows for a scalable contact tracing solution that is accurate, efficient and instantaneous. For these reasons, many other governments and institutions such as the NHS in the UK and MIT Media Lab in the US are developing applications using similar Bluetooth-based approaches. One caveat, according to the researchers at the University of Oxford, is that effective digital herd protection, as it's known, requires 60% of the population to voluntarily download and use the app. That's a big ask. Contact tracing does have one major weakness, asymptomatic spreaders. These are individuals that carry the disease, pass it on to others, but don't have symptoms themselves and don't isolate. But how many asymptomatic carriers of COVID-19 are there? Well, it's difficult to calculate. One study focuses on the Diamond Princess cruise ship, which was hit by coronavirus and quarantined in Japanese waters on the 3rd of February, with 3,711 passengers and crew. 634 individuals ended up testing positive for COVID-19. 52% showed no symptoms at the time. Approximately 30% of those went on to show symptoms later, leaving 18% testing positive, but never showing any signs of illness. Other studies in Japan and China suggest the figure could be as high as 30%. For these reasons, contact tracing must work alongside rigorous widespread testing and other social distancing measures to ensure lives are not put in any unnecessary risk when countries emerge from lockdown. That's it for this Razor COVID-19 special. Stay safe, look after yourselves, and we'll see you next time.